Welcome to Real Flicks Reviews. We're like a book club for people who hate reading. This month we're doing films that are underrated. We bring you a Simpsons episode, and we bring you a special review of the short film A Girl and Her Gun. So the description of Match Stick Men is another IMDb classic. A phobic con artist and his protege are on the verge of pulling off a lucrative swindle when the former's teenage daughter arrives unexpectedly. It's an interesting way to say that Nicolas Cage had a daughter in this film. <laughs> the former. The former what? <laughs> the former phobic con. Anyways, um, so this one's got Nick Cage, it's got Sam Rockwell, and Allison Lohman. And you know, I actually really enjoy Sam Rockwell. Uh, he, I think he's a great actor. Um, we yeah. did a movie of uh, a while back of his Seven uh, Psychopaths, and we also did uh, <laughs> Confessions of a Dangerous Mind That's as right. well. Yeah, <laughs> which is another uh, really great Sam Rockwell role. So, I I think he did a great job. Um, the one. I, we look at Nick Cage in this one. I think this one is something that we don't see him do very often. You mean act? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I don't have an argument there. Way of describing it. I was kind of wondering if when this movie came out, he was talking about what type of accent he's going to choose because his <laughs> accent's the same one, and everybody's wondering, where's that accent from? I His psychotic brain. So I'm, I'm yeah. going to say something that I, I don't think I've ever said together at the same time i liked nicholas cage in this movie <laughs> i um there's there's movies he's in that i find entertaining but i've never said good job and nick cage in the same sentence yeah um yeah, his... I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty rare i would agree <laughs> rare i'd say it's almost impossible well, look, I, I mean it's, look it's not that he can't do a good job it's just that he's he's almost a little too crazy for his own good sometimes you know yeah and um, one of my other favorite Nick Cage films is Face Off because I find it amusing to watch. Whoa. Hold on, to watch John Travolta's version of Nick Cage, and Nick Cage's impersonation of John Travolta. I think that's a really funny part of that film. That's the only thing I really enjoy about that entire film. But you know, I gotta say this is one of the few, if all, if not the only Nick Cage movie that his co-star doesn't carry the film. Think about that. I would also say Con Air. Yeah, some degree. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, well, Sam, Sam Rockwell has a tendency to sort of just kind of dissolve into the character, so he's not really—he's yeah. a scene stealer, but but steady in the background. Like, like you just his characters are, are just incredibly interesting. Yeah. Um, but he can totally hold a movie. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody out there who hasn't seen that flick, Moon, it was a, a independent movie that he did. Basically, he, he was the entire cast. It was all. Freaking fantastic movie. I, I actually agree uh, with, with Ryan. He's not heavy-handed. Like, yeah. every movie Nick Cage is in, even if he's not supposed to be the sleb, the star in it, he just sucks up the film. Well, what's, what's kind of funny For, about this one is, is both of them, both Nick Cage and Sam Rockwell, don't, they really feed the material in this yeah. movie. Um, I agree with you that it's under rated honestly um because this it didn't it got really mixed reviews when it came out some of them thought it was you know sort of sort of same old con artist sort of a movie where you get the the, the twist then the double twist then the triple twist and it's it's sort of this this chess match with the audience yeah um, and, and and don't forget this is this, i think the characters sorry go ahead I was going to say, don't forget, this is a Ridley Scott film. Yeah. I mean, this we is just kind did a Ridley Scott just. This is two coming weeks ago. from Blade Runner, Aliens, The Martian. This, this, this is a director who yeah. has a ton of tools in his a bag. A lot of chops, yeah. Um, and I got to say, to talk a, a, a little bit about Nick Cage character, I love the kind of the twerks, the the weird things he the gives. Ticks. ticks. That's it, the twerks. That's yes, right. yeah. There's a scene, something I want to see. Holy <laughs> shit. Um, I love the ticks he gave his character um, from the vocals yeah, yeah. to the eyes to the rituals. I mean, this was a really flushed out character for yeah, But, but for not him. in the, uh, the over-the-top way that we're kind of used to seeing Nick Cage. You know, uh, By the way, anybody thinks that I'm giving undue shit to Nick Cage, go watch Season of the Witch, then talk to me. Uh, <laughs> but, but really, that's kind of 
or or, or Ghost Rider. We've sort of come to expect from Nick Cage is this big, giant, crazy hair over the top sort of face off performance. But um, when he's actually given the opportunity with just you know great material and a halfway interesting story. He, he serves it, you know, yeah. really well. No, I, I agree. And this isn't like Gone in 60 Seconds, where, where Nick Cage was the least yes. interesting part of the movie. So that's the thing is, those movies, they're all fluff. I mean, it's, it's yeah. all fluff where you have this guy who can kind of deliver some halfway decent one-liners, like in Con Air. Right. Yeah. I mean, By the way, I love Con Air, I, I'm just saying. No, I that's agree. I actually like Gone in 60 Seconds, but the best... The, the, the only thing that the best actor in the whole movie is that 1967 GT 500. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and the, the part about this movie that, and it was really obvious, but I was thinking about it is this movie doesn't really hint. It's a con like a lot of these type of movies. Yeah. It doesn't give away its hand. I mean, it, to me, well, it was it, obvious you, you, as a, as a movie goer, I think you sort of feel it coming anyway, but at the same time, you're so kind of engrossed in the actual characters that you really forget that there's probably going to be this twist. It's a classic misdirection. So yeah. Kind of maybe, maybe Way it's better be- than what they had in Sixth Sense. Or The yeah. Happening. The, the director, he who must not be named. Um, <laughs> to me, it was it was obvious what was happening, but I, I think if you, if you forget the fact that I'm thinking, you know, a couple of head steps of the movie, they didn't play it off really well. They didn't do what Swordfish did, which is give little hints. And I, I was really amazed. I was even yeah. surprised where they took it at the end, where he had to chaotically chase down his his ex wife, and uh, and uh, in a way Nick only Nick Cage can do it. Yeah, that was kind of creeper style. Yeah, it's like I know where you've always been. That's the uh, that's the part of the the, the the con that I that I really dug. I mean, because the, the 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 actual you know what it turns out to be, because you got sort of sort of every level. You know, you got your low-level things, the, uh, the 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 training montage, if you will, of, of this flick with him and his his daughter. But then when you finally get to sort of like like the big reveal, even if you sort of saw it coming, uh, was that the the actual story, the character story behind it, with um, sort of his his protege Sam Rockwell, kind of student becomes the master. Yeah. Sort of, he's been playing the ultra ultra long con just because he's. So so acutely aware of this guy's his tics and his his idiosyncratic behavior yeah yeah and i was gonna say the one part of this movie that i i thought deserved much more credit than it did was the end con when it did the the if you ever watched the original mission impossible not the shitty movies the tv series they actually did it was pretty much the whole show was basically that and that was something that i really appreciated that was up on a rooftop somewhere and I that was impressive. I really liked that. <laughs> you mean the hospital scene? Is yeah. Up? Okay. I was trying it? not to give too much away just for the hell of it. We spoil every damn movie we talk about. Come True. on. True. I loved the hospital scene. That whole thing was really well done. <laughs> yeah, I like the fact that they kind of had it played off on on both types, where you even have the um, the detectives in the other room kind of playing along with each other of, you know, you can't hear anything over the beeping and all that stuff. But um, now my big thing was, I wonder how much Sam Rockwell paid everybody. (laughs) Why? Because the girl says she got ripped off. Oh, and then I wonder how much he paid the doctor and how much he paid the detectives. If he paid him at all. See, I was thinking they were in on the con and they were just his friends, you know? That very well could be, but I mean, if you think about how well Sam Rockwell's character was, he's always he's always looking for a way to to cheat somebody out of something, and that's the character he played, which I think he did a fantastic job. And I really appreciated the fact that most of the film was only between really three characters. Oh yeah, there wasn't very much interaction with the uh, with uh, any other characters besides those three. I would I would almost say two. To give me uh, four. I mean, this is kind of a stretch. I'd say Nick Cage. Oh, the doctor. And I'd say, well, Nick Cage and Nick Cage when he just goes over the edge. I'd say okay, he was okay. two characters. Okay, I could see that. So Nick Cage with his uh, placebo pills. Yeah. And Nick Cage without he, them. Yeah. Okay. What do you think, Ryan? Yeah. <laughs> He's saying that Nick Cage played two characters: his uh, his psychotic uh, uh, phobic self and. Oh the, yeah. Yeah. yeah drugged up thinking he's fine self. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, yeah, Nick Nick play uh, Nick Cage plays um, plays a really really good kind of kind of crazy. Nick, um, Nick Cage plays crazy and, good. I don't think he's acting. I mean, I think I think in certain ways he is. I mean, he might be drawing on personal experience, but um, but yeah, I mean, like like well, like you brought up, and as far as as far as the ticks and 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 the the the, the quirkiness, um, he's got a. Uh, Oh, oh, really unique. I mean, that's a, that's a, that was a unique choice, you know, that he made. I'm sure he and, you know, the, the filmmakers kind of went over, you know, what it should be, but the, the, the way that he played it was really, really interesting. It was a bitch in performance. I, I'm still flabbergasted at the fact that we're all saying the same thing about Nick Cage. I mean, Mr. <laughs> Ghostwriter himself. <laughs> well, well that... I mean, look, there, there's, there's a reason that he's such a big name that he's just done the paycheck movies like Ghostwriter. Oh, um, no, I, I, I agree. I think this is one thing I'd love to see Nick Cage getting back to is taking roles that makes you sit back and go, whoa, this guy can act instead of oh, the yeah. fact that... I mean, every every now and again, I mean, you know, he comes out with like an adaptation where it just blows your hair back, you know? Because I think, I don't know if he's, he, he's made any movies since this movie was made that I would say that I was impressed by. Yeah, well, I have to go through the go through the list. Because, I mean, he, he, he sort of perpetually makes, um, you know, like a movie a year, more or less, whether yeah. we sort of know about it or not. So he's the Steven Seagal of whatever acting style he is. Well, you know, a lot, well, he a lot goes, of people do that. Uh, he uh, goes from action to drama to action to drama to action to drama, see, think, kids movie, action, drama. I, I'm, it's kind of what he keeps on doing. I, I'm, I'm also thinking maybe it's kind of my theory of acting is each actor has at least one genre or one type of character they're good at. And I'm thinking this act, this type of character is really his butter zone. I mean, Con Air was kind of similar, a little bit neurotic. I think the same way we're gone in 60 seconds. Um, n both characters, not as much as this one. Well, the film, uh, you were saying <clears throat> that you don't think he's really made a good film since this. I, I mean, there's a few of his ancillary ones that I haven't seen. But the one that I would say that I enjoyed after this one, but it wasn't because of his acting. It was because of the other characters that outshined him was Kick-Ass. And, I mean... Even his role as Big Daddy in that one, I mean, I don't think was a really fantastic job. It wasn't horrible. It was kind of like you know, all I, standard, I guess. You know, I would standardish. I, I would give you that. I guess I should say movies that he carried, like he was the title character. You know, the top. I don't think Billy. there's very many in his repertoire that I mean. That I think I, I would think say are up to this quality. I think Nick Cage is 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 sort of um, at war with his with his craziness. Um, but he's got kind of the it factor, you know, um, no, I, that, that sort of, cause I'm sitting here trying to think like, yeah, man, damn it. He was good in, in kick gas. Why did I like him so much? And I really couldn't put it into words. So, I mean, it's, it's really just that, that sort of charismatic, uh, performance that kind of just bleeds through no matter what shitty movie or, or role or good role or what have you that he's, that he's doing at the moment. I no, um, I I totally agree. I watch his movies just because I suspect it's going to be a train wreck in motion. Um, I mean, dude, seriously, I watch Con Air and The Rock at least once a year. They're not they're not good movies. You can't sit there and defend that. No, you know? yeah. Um, so I so this this movie I'm I'm beyond impressed with. <laughs> I'm trying to think more characters that I, I like and. Uh, honestly, I don't think you could have picked a better cast um, from. The the chick you know from Angela the the chick who played Angela she was twenty two at the time by the way seriously yeah Yahtzee um, she played a really great teenager yeah and yeah. and Sam Rack Rockwell I do think he's the runaway star in this movie though because he blends I mean, in is quite, it, quietly, Sam Rockwell's quietly one of the best actors in the world he, yeah he's an amazing character actor he is he, he I mean like I I don't think I've seen a movie with him in it that I haven't liked on some level and, and i mean i still yeah, say like, Con confessions of a dangerous mind is one of my all-time favorite rockwell films it's oh, like dude for sure and that's that like actually a uh, uh that was george clooney's hello i know um <laughs> trying not to st step over me yeah it was a george clooney film that was fantastic yeah oh. yeah the thing I also liked about this film is how they uh, how they basically 
talked about what a con man is and his his moral fiber as a con man. I, this character, for being a Nick Cage movie, of course, it's really Scott. That's why is really flushed out. Each character is very individual. There may be some sort of archetypal character, but they're really well done. Yeah, and I think that's chops to the director than anybody else. Yeah, I mean, but you got Ridley Scott. I mean, that guy is—he's one of the, probably the the top five directors of you know the twentieth century. Actually, if you really think yeah, about it, oh, not, easily. Not a not a not really a movie that that, that you can just be like, no, nope, no, nope, not a lot of fan. I mean, he he sort of universally makes pretty good movies, but actually kind of dialed it back for this one. You know, coming off of stuff like Blade Runner and Alien, these big yeah. hundred million dollar movies. You know, really really scales it back and kind of you know had I I, I actually should have looked this up as far as where the, the source material was uh, or it, if it was just a, from like a book. original screenplay. It's a. It's actually, from what I understand, it's based on a book. I don't remember the name. Okay, of the book. Okay, well, that would make sense because it actually the the, the actual story and, and and the way that it's told, um, is is really good. Um, but you know, the thing I want to mention about this film is that it's not like Ryan's talking about. You know, the Ridley Scott films. You got like Blade Runner, Aliens, all these really you know, uh, um, action packed films, but this is not an action packed film. This is a story driven film. There's no real action scenes. There's nobody, you know, shooting anything up or running from an enemy type. thing. But I would say Ridley Scott has the ability to tell a story, a very, a very good story within that narrative action. So I think the one key thread this has is there's a really good story in every one of his movies, whether you like the movie or not, there's still a story. There's still some flesh in there. Yeah. Um, what do you give this movie, Ryan? Um, four, four and a half, man. I mean, there's, there's really not much wrong with this movie. Yeah. Uh, then yeah. I mean, there's, there's really not much wrong. I mean, you know, like I said, I mean, you, you can kind of see maybe a couple of these cons coming. They, they they telegraph a little bit if you're if you're paying attention. But as as sort of for for most movies, but I mean, as far as just the material and the execution by the actors, uh, I mean, yeah, dude, four four out of five or four point five. James, yeah, yeah, I I gotta agree with Ryan on the actual same thing because I was, you know, it's it's not a perfect movie. It's not like a five out of five, but it but it does deserve a very high rating, so four and a half. I agree. I, it, it deserves it. Uh, you know, I, I give it a four. Um, I liked I liked the movie. Um, I don't know. I, I just I'll stick with the standard four. Basic same reasons, just half a point less. Yeah. Um, and so next we're going to switch to The Simpsons, and that was James's pick. So uh, so we're doing. Uh, uh, Brian can correct me. I believe it is season six, episode eighteen. A star is Burns. Um, this one, you know, I, I am a huge Simpsons fan. I don't really talk about it in in this show, but I'm a really big Simpsons fan. I watched all the way up until 2002 when Fox and, uh, uh, Matt Groening Groening had, had issues. And I stepped out of watching the Simpsons after that, but I hear the show's doing great. But this one out of all the seasons that I have, I have 12 of them. This one has always been my favorite episode. And I could rave about it, but I want to leave it over to, to John, who's not a big Simpsons fan. Ryan kind of is, is on board with the, the Simpsons, but maybe, maybe I want to s- have you start off with, with what you think about I, this I one. would say maybe someday we'll release that infamous quiz of yours on the... Uh, I've changed it from quiz to test. <laughs> okay, test. <laughs> I guess it'll be closed book. Um, it's 100 questions. <laughs> Oh, uh, this was one of the few um, I've never didn't really watch when the earlier when when I was a kid didn't really watch much Simpsons. Not that I wasn't allowed, just really wasn't my thing. But this was one of the first one that I remember James saying, "You've got to watch this." And this was probably one of the few that really impressed me. That wasn't a lot of standard Simpsons gags, but still was at the same time. Yeah, um, very well. It was a one of the few crossover. Crossovers of Simpsons yeah, that I can had, remember. They had John Lovitz come in to play uh, Jay Sherman, who is the critic. And that right. was a short lived cartoon series. Yes, thank and God. That, that actually was a cartoon series for those yeah, of you who missed it. It was a cartoon. It was pretty f- funny, but yeah. it was pretty short lived. Yeah. I didn't like that cartoon. Um, it wasn't the greatest, but you know. I, I liked it, well, honestly. It was, it was a little heady for, for us when we were like 12. Well, actually, although we, we didn't really 
describe the plot of the of this well, I was, episode. I was going to get plot, into it. Oh, but you okay, can do you it. You can do it. Uh, well, s- they find out that Springfield is one of the, the nation's crappiest cities of all time. They hold a town hall, and they decide to go along with having the whole town. Anybody could put in a film and have Jay Sherman come out, and they would um, they would rate the films. So it was just an idea to possibly... Uh, uh, bring in some tourists and some people into the town. I, I to think stimulate. it would help. I think it would help if the Springfield was actually in a state. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah. I mean, obviously, that's one of the big running gags. So. Yeah. Um, I, I honestly, the 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 burn. No, who's the the character, the drunk Barney? Yes, Barney. Barney Gumbel. Barney Gumbel's Barney. film is probably my favorite. I, and it's really hard to describe this, honestly, the Simpsons episode without seeing it. It's one of the few times you realize the bastards behind the Simpsons are actually really amazing. They just don't show it all the time. Yes. Um, yeah. This is just an amazing episode. I, I'm just going to say you've got to watch it. It's one of the few that I think when the Simpsons ends, it'll be the one in the best of. Probably yeah. in the be- in the number one spot. Yeah, this one is one of the, the I would say, one of my f- well, favorite top rated ones. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely going to break into a top 10 list. But, but honestly, I would say this is kind of quintessential when when Simpsons are, are really firing. They they have such a high concept right at the beginning of the episode. It's par for the course. You know, like, we're the, we're the least popular city in, in the country. What do we do about it? You know, comedy ensues. Yeah. Uh, but this one, it was, it was kind of this, like, inside baseball sort of thing where they get to talk a little shit about critics, uh, which is always freaking hilarious because critics suck. Um, yes, I realize the irony, and I do think we suck too. Um, and the popularity contest that the Oscars are. Yeah, exactly. So you know, I mean, those just those little subtle jabs yeah. I mean, is kind of what they they were for. Now, and we don't James care if you're popular; just watch to, our show. What James is referring to by sort of season twelve, right in there, when when Granny and whatnot sort of stopped being writers and more of the creative consultant kind of a kind of a type. We were from sort of the original days of The Simpsons, I fully recognize that people far younger than us would have sort of their own version or their own generation, you know, that just went on. Like, uh, I don't watch my parents Saturday Night Live. Well, they, I don't watch I, I don't, now, but I, still. I don't think there's a lot of people who are younger than us that re- realize that Simpsons is a spinoff television show either. Yeah. Which well, yeah, it is. It was a thing on Tracy Ullman show back in the day and then quickly got its own its own spot just because it was so damn funny. Yeah. So, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I really think there's – it's one of the best shows, especially right up until about season 12, 13 in there. That's why I consider canon, you know. So, yeah, we're, so I, w- I want to bring one thing in for uh, audience viewers who may not be familiar with The Simpsons. This is one of the few episodes that doesn't have running gags. Like you, there's uh, quite a lot of Simpsons episodes that they refers to something back like a season before, or even farther than that. And this is one of the few Simpsons that doesn't have inside jokes along with it. So that's one of the other reasons why I, if I'm introducing somebody to the Simpsons, this is one of the first episodes I show them. Because yeah. you don't have to have seen, you know, six seasons to get all the jokes. And you can really get the flavor of it and get get sort of what the show is, is about and the direction that it's coming from pretty easily just from that episode. Yeah. So we're going to give this episode a must watch as I actually agree this is an amazing episode. And with that being said, we do have a Facebook page. Love us, hate us. Let us know. And you can also donate to Old Guy Tech TV and Real Flicks Reviews to help keep the lights on. And also tell you, we are now an audio podcast. You can catch us on great sites such as Podbean, Stitcher, and more. And now we're going to go to, we were specifically specially asked to review a short film by, a, by the writer and director, a Paul Holdbrook. Hopefully I'm saying his, his name right, of Shunk Films. The short is titled "A Girl and Her Gun." Um, <laughs> Wonder why Ryan's over there giggling. I'm sorry. I just like the way you said it, like a fucking sportscaster. A girl <laughs> and her gun. Eh, um, I, I I probably say this about short films too much, but I really liked this short film, and and it's roughly 18 minutes long, and when storytelling is done well, like this. It's amazing. They had 18 minutes to execute a story. 
get everybody to immediately understand the story or get the drift of the story. I, this is I it's really well done, really pulled off. The color's amazing, and this is also a UK film. Um, it'll be sometime soon going to hit the indie film and short film uh, circuits soon. It has not been released to the public. So, yeah, um, you know, you're, you're right in the sense that um, this film is uh, really well told. And I got to give a lot of credit to uh, Matilda Randall. Yes. Um, she was the, uh, the one referred to as the girl. You find out at the end that her name is actually Sarah. But she only had one line in the entire film. I think she did a fantastic job yeah, of uh, being able to to tell her story through her facial expressions and, body language. Her, and her body language. Um, that is not an easy skill to get. I would I would say one of the highlight scenes for me on that particularly was when she was in school. There's a this this boy and girl that are kind of beating up on her, and her head's down, her hair's over her eyes. That to me was one of the scenes that just really, just really told how she was feeling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, there was there was a there was a bunch of things I liked about this. Uh, first of all, serious props to the to the to the filmmakers on this one because the the composition of 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 this was was really great i mean a a great eye for 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 framing a shot in kind of such a way that you're always really focused on her that's um you know that's that's who it's following first of all i actually really like the opening credits you there (laughs) i no i i don't know if no but i agree with ryan that oh what were you saying ryan you were cut off Oh no! I was just saying I I really like that that uh, that genre uh, specific intro, um, but for the, for it, for it being kind of a sort of a sort of a love letter to 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 genre movies. Uh, Darn, that spaghetti western. Interesting the way they kind of kind of ended it. Uh, Aren't you happy to see Lee Van Cleef? You, you have all the symbolism and whatnot with 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 her sort of plight and and and, and the, the the films that she sort of identifies with yeah. and. And things like that, and then happens to find a single action, uh, 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 Colt single action army, which is basically the same gun you'd be using in a in a, in a western movie. Yeah. Um, by the way, that's the one thing that actually irritated me. Uh, well, I have to assume that it's a it's a it's a replica of a gun, because an actual single action army in the states would be running about five or six grand. So that lady complaining that she couldn't find anything of a value. I would um, I would say one of the reasons I think she didn't find anything of value is she didn't know what she was looking for. Well, yeah, I, I, she says true, on the phone, you know. she hints that the person she's talking to knows what she's supposed to be looking for. Yeah, I, I do think maybe she, this is kind of a guess in the character, maybe this is a character that doesn't know a lot, specifically maybe like the worth of firearms, especially in a country when they're really well, hard she, to get. I, I know, I was, I was really see. just making a, a, a joke. Um but uh, but no 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 seriously getting back to just kind of the way it was shot and the way it was framed um, not really giving a, a face to the bullies and the people outside of her apartments very much um, and still really just focusing on on her reaction to her incredibly crazy situation yeah but um, and I, yeah kind of I, I kind of get I think I get his point um, I'd really like to hear from uh, from from Paul Holbrook and see what is uh his, his sort of his sort of message was if it was kind of just an allegory to you know what it is to to you know have a gun in that kind of a stressing environment and it's not always a hero story kind of a thing i i um i gotta say one thing i think that this 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 short film or really hit it off with everybody is everybody has similar experiences with this so this automatically without really introducing a whole lot you automatically know what she's going through or or feeling to some degree or another um the other thing i thought was amazing like ryan said was how the westerns became kind of her her salvation in a way and how the the way I thought it was going to end was going to be like Pale Rider, mm. and yeah. I, I love the twist at the end. I'll, I'll be honest, I saw it coming a little bit, but I love how instead of externalizing it, it was an internalized punishment because she's like, I'm I'm tired of it. Instead of doing the Pale Rider, yeah, bit. I have a name. I'm a person. I mean, I actually kind of felt a little bit of a bait and switch because I really kind of got like the, uh, the 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 Matilda, not the actress who played the girl, but the Matilda from uh, Leon. 
Yeah. Uh, Luke Song's movie. Um, I really got that kind of a vibe, like, oh, this this chick's, I hope she doesn't go, you know, Columbine on everybody, but I, I, I sense a little vigilante justice coming somebody's way. Well, you know, the the thing I got to say about the film... Um, it's just because I'm American, though, I think. I, I, I think I just showed my, my, my colors. Yeah, but I'm going to approach this from a, from a different angle than, than you guys are. Um, a left angle? Well, I think the way that they portrayed everything, a lot of shorts seem trying to fit everything in in a, in a short amount of time. You know, we, we talked about shorts and, you know, we've said that they can be five minutes, they can be up to 40 minutes, you know, type of thing. But I think this in, being told in 18 minutes was really well done because a lot of shorts seem to get disconjointed at times. Yes. I thought this one was followed in a very systematic, very well thought out direction. I, I no, I totally agree. And there wasn't any last scenes. This yes. was very well stitched together. Yeah, there no... wasn't any wasted film footage. Um, I, I got to give that hats off to Paul Horburg as, as the director and writer of this one. Um, I'm not sure how you guys went about the story storyboard process or anything, but whatever you guys did, you did a fantastic job with it. Um, and and as Ryan said, I did get the Luc Besson type of uh, feel on it. I also got a little bit of kind of the Quentin Tarantino with some of the... It could yeah. have been just because of the Western way you did it. It kind of followed along with how he did in Kill Bill. But Well, that's, that's what I was saying. It's kind of a love letter to the, to the genre. Yeah. Whereas Tarantino did the same sort of thing. You know? Yeah, so I, I appreciate that because we are... We've also mentioned that we are Quentin Tarantino fans and Luke Besson fans. But, and I'm a big Western movie fan. Yeah, there you go. and a big Western movie fan. Um, so looking at it that way, but I think the way that that he brought it up, you could, like John was saying, he kind of saw it coming, is because the film really shows that this girl doesn't have anything her escape really is the tv and even her mom's encroaching on that territory with her boyfriend what does she have left she goes to school she's getting uh no help from her from her um teachers yeah teachers or peers or whoever that guy was i don't know if he was supposed to be you know a monitor or what but he just kind of looked at the situation and ignored it so uh, the ending i think she's crying out saying hey i am somebody and the only person who even saw that she was somebody was the the um, officer who was at her father's bedside when he died so there's and i, I kind of want to know a little bit why he was saying your father is a hero in the beginning of the film because they don't yeah. explain that well but, I, I got the impression that her dad was was the uh the the only one that kind of gave a shit and now yeah. she lost him it was it was sort of sort of the yeah. end of it all and i so would kind of see what it happened is she lost all hope and i would add there was one more person so, who cared it's probably because of, that was her job was the lady from was it the council or whatnot that lady that knocked on her door yeah but you and know was yeah. thinking, she wasn't and i think that the reason why she didn't realize is that was that could have been her moment for call for help because at that point yeah. in the film she hadn't been to school in a couple of days no food you know it was just like her her and everything that her she had that really held her life together had gone yeah, yeah. and i i do think even though part of the ending was predictable I was okay with that. Yeah. Because it was, it, it's just like my theory on, on nudity is if nudity is part of the, the plot, then it's okay. But it was, if it's excess, it's a waste. Yeah. And well, I think, I think they told a more poignant story. I agree. The, the way that they did it. Um, cause the way, the way that I was sort of suggesting, you know, like that she, that she went a little, uh, a little vigilante on everybody was, was sort of the symbolism that they were you driving hope towards you the God and with the, the films that she was watching, but then sort of just snapping it back into this, like just distressed, distressed young. Darn. Yeah. Young girl. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. You know, the distressed moment of it and that you're wanting an out and this is the only option I, you can see. And the very ending scene was the, she was in the hospital. Yeah. And the, and there was the, the cop the officer. There was a the cop at the beginning. Um, that I really liked that because in the back of my mind, I'm hoping she's going to make a recovery. They see somebody who really, who really likes her, like that that has hope for her. And that was the one part that's like, hey, there's a little bit of hope. Yeah. And that you know, and I think I think we as people still love hopeful messages, and we like people who triumph. And I think this that was the the ending I really like because there's a chance for her. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when she was standing over the bedside pointing the gun at her at her mom's boyfriend and her, it was kind of like he, he, you wanted her to to squeeze the trigger, but it's like 
is that the real route that she wants to go? I mean, because there was the hint that her her dad was uh, handcuffed to the bed, so he yeah. was obviously had 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 done something that um, I figured he might didn't have, fit with the law or anything. Because I was thinking, because if you look at his knuckles, they were tore up. So I'm thinking yeah, maybe so he just kicked somebody's ass. He stood ass. up for somebody or his daughter thinking or something. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's one of, I think it's a, a very sad story, but it also, I think it brings you into thinking, and, you know, it's one of those that there's a lot of direction that people can go with this. Um, a couple things that came to mind was this could be, you know, anti-gun, but, you know, don't leave a gun where a kid can access it, you know, type thing. And then it can also go the route of um, of the effects of TV violence on her, but that's her out, you know. So it's like, where is it going? Or anti-bullying? I think it's that we. I think as a person looking at this, I think it's you know you got to take that extra step for the kid that seems isolated, you know. Yeah, and isolating yeah. themselves. I, I, and I think I think that was sort of sort of the maybe the overall message it might have been sort yeah. of equal parts of all of the above yeah. you know that you just mentioned um but uh, obviously it was it was the confluence of events that they kind of the kind of letter there and and all of these this perfect storm of shit not to mention her her finding this old gun and her dad's stuff but the thing i, I, wanna, I, I would I, I, I would like to add as a person who kind of really under at least personally understands what she she kind of went through in some degrees. Um, I, I guess the thing I would say is like what kind of James said was even if you don't like the person or they're strange, there's still a person and the person will always, you know, it, they're a cry for helps. Yeah. And that was the one thing that I got is she didn't, there was nobody there anymore that would answer her cry. Yeah. And, and um, do you have any more to say? Yeah. I was going to bring up this, this last point. Um, when we're looking at shorts, we, I look for something that, that, uh, stirs a discussion or makes you think and, and does it in a very succinct way and doesn't waste time. And I think this one actually really fits the bill on it. I was actually, I, you know, I didn't really know what to expect, you know, try to come in a blank slate. And, um, you know, I, I actually enjoyed the fact that it, it came in and made you think and, you know, I really gotta say, hats off to the girl who did who did a fantastic job. I do hope you continue on with acting. Yeah. So um, I, I think you got a career so there. What do you somewhere. give it? Um, I don't know. For me, it's not a not a perfect one out there. I think there was um, some things that kind of distracted me. Like I, like I said, there was. I felt a lot of different um, influences on it, and I would have liked to have seen something a little bit more. Um, I don't want to say original, but you know, like the directing style to kind of stand alone out outside of it. So, I I actually give it a four out of five, um, and I think that was the only thing that kind of I was like, eh, you know. So I I so. give this. I'll be honest. I give this out of five out of five because I think this is this is simple storytelling at its best. Yeah. This this lets you immediately within a couple at least a minute or two understand everything you're immediately into it you immediately understand and you emphasize it with with a character yeah empathize and that in any length of film i mean even with matchstick men i don't think you empathize with the character as much as you do with this this little girl yeah um so for me it's a it's a five out of five bait you know even i love the directing the color i even love the soundtrack so yeah that was another thing i i thought um i, I don't know what what you guys filmed it in but it was very clean beautiful film so very clean and, i i do give you that as well and i love the background shots every honestly i'm just a really big fan of this film if you can't tell and ryan you're up um i, I i'm with james that's uh then I, I, I'd kind of like to see something, uh, you know, maybe a little more u unique to the to the to the to his own style of filmmaking. Yeah. Um, that being said, I mean, truly, truly great performances. Um, yeah. Matilda, whose name I don't have in front of me, but but Randall. good on you. Um, the the editing and the composition style I thought were beautiful. I thought yeah. it was a great, great um, uh, look of the movie. Great way to tell the story. Uh, I can't wait to see what this guy does with like yeah. a feature length. Yeah, so, I, yeah, I hope to see more of your stuff. So, what did you give it, Ryan? Just a four? Uh, a four, as well as as well as James. Um, again, not not perfect, but 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 really, 
nothing to quibble about on this. I thought it was yeah. Story yeah, time. I mean, just the reason why it's not an extra point is, is it, it's a very fine line uh, of almost that extra point. It's it's close, but well, but when I, when people start out, you know, especially doing short films and things like that, you you end up kind of doing a lot of things that you were influenced by as yeah. a youth, or or when you kind of first got into it. So some of that I can forgive as I mean just somebody finding their style. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he's he's yelling at me right now. So like I, I have stuff. but I, um, I, but you kind of know what I mean. You you sort of inadvertently, you know, grab a little Scorsese here, a little Tarantino there. And I'm not saying he did that. I but it was definitely yeah, don't call it Scorsese, a love man. for the for the genre <laughs> of, of westerns and was filmed as such. Yeah. You know? so, so if you out there in TV land, podcasting land, whatever the particular, your proclivity is, you want to call it, if you want to keep That's in touch, end. if you want to see what this gentleman's up to, it's shunkfilms.co.uk. Check them out. We recommend that when you're able to watch this, you watch this. We want to thank you, That's, Mr. Holbrook. Uh, for Spell shunk for people. It's S-H-U-N-K yeah. films.co.uk. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Um, and hopefully, you got, hopefully everybody out there and tv land but we'll be able to to watch it soon uh we personally here at real flicks reviews want to thank you yes we appreciate being let in on this it was actually very exciting to sit down and watch something that that we were requested for i appreciate it thank yeah, you yeah 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 and if and if anybody out there has ever watched real flicks reviews you understand we're a giant fan of short films yeah and so we're going to be doing another round of short film soon we can't really say when but we will, because everybody here loves short films. Yeah, and Ryan's up. Uh, he needs to batter up. Uh, oh, so I'm picking my, what I feel is an underrated movie? That's yep. a bingo. Yeah, you wow. usually okay. follow me. Do you have a show as well? Um, if you can't tell, a show. If you can't tell apparently he didn't do his homework. Like a half an hour ago, but I, I, I've promptly <laughs> forgotten it. Oh, hopefully I can remember by the end of my spiel. spiel. Um, okay, so Matchstick Men... Totally agreed. Underrated movie. Asks the question, who's conning who? I ask another question, James and John. Okay. okay. Who watches The Watchmen? All right. All right. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So this this movie, I'm kind of going through because I, I sort of I sort of take this one seriously. Like, what do I feel is like an actual underrated movie? And um, Zack Snyder, who, who recently sort of sort of bombed, and I gave a lot of shit to for for, for Batman v Superman, yes, Nick Watchmen in two thousand uh, two thousand nine. Okay, going through like Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb and checking out just sort of sort of random ratings and things like that. Come across Rotten Tomatoes, and this is getting like a sixty five. To me, this is this is this is egregious. Um, oh. So I'm making everybody watch it. Okay. And uh, so, do you have a, a television show? An uh, um, television show. An I know I had something which I can't think of. Maybe it'll be on the internet by the time we post this. <laughs> so just do me a favor. Let me know what it is. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, I imagine that would be the way it gets on the internet. That, <laughs> pretty much. But. That's a great start. <laughs> um, so uh, I gave the movie Magic Men a four to five. James gave it a 4.5 out of 5. Ryan gave it a similar 4.5 out of 5. We gave the Simpsons episode a must-watch. And for the short film, A Girl and Her Gun, written and directed by a Paul Holdbrook, I'm sorry, which I gave it a 5 out of 5. James gave it a 4 to 5. Ryan also gave it a 4 to 5. We give it, when you can see it, you've got to watch it. And as always, thank you for watching. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you.